Hi everybody, I'm Melinda Galland. Oh, I've got a great show for you today. We are going to talk to terrific people about Uganda, so far away from Cape Cod, but so important to all, everyone in the world, in fact. So come along, let's have another Cape Conversations. Hi everybody, I'm Melinda Galland. Oh, I've got a great guys here today, two wonderful men, and they're doing wonderful things in the world. And they live in Falmouth and Sandwich. So I am with Ed and John. How are you today? Good, 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 good morning. Good to see you both. Great, Great to see you too. So Linda. glad to have you here to talk about what we're going to talk about. It's Great. so exciting. Great to be here. Yeah. So tell me, I'm going to start with you, Ed. Okay. Tell me about what you're doing in Africa, in Uganda, which is a long ways away from Sandwich, Massachusetts. <laughs> it sure is. And I just had a long journey there in July. Is that right? Yeah, and I traveled there 20 years ago, so there was a 20 year gap. Yikes. But um, this year I went to visit a, a very special place called Bethany Land Institute, which is about an hour away from the capital city, Kampala. It's in a more rural, but there's still an urban feel to it in, in parts. Uh, where our institute is uh, in Nandere, um, is not, um, I would say it's very rural there. Yeah. And um, we're, we're doing great work um, relative to training young Ugandans mm -hmm. how to farm with using regenerative agriculture methodologies. Okay, so what you're, what you're telling me is the Bethany Institute is there and they started this program and why did they start the program? So the program was started by three priests. Um, the idea was at least germinated with the three priests many uh -huh. years ago about how they can give back and how they can help after being in the priesthood for 25 years. Uh -huh. And they looked to rural poverty and the degradation of the land in their hometown, in their home country, um, as a way of giving back. What can they do? They can acquire land, they can educate people, they can improve the environment. And so they began this long journey, which is a bit arduous in a place like Uganda, given uh, real estate law, given the looseness and the corruption sure. involved in the country. So it took them a number of years, starting in 2012. Along the way, they acquired a little bit of land. They formed a five-year plan. They got money. They got the church involved, which was very important in order, mm. to, order to establish the land, and really got it kicked off in 2019, just before COVID. Um, and that's how the whole thing really started, with those three men. Uh, who were boyhood, fr boyhood friends, bringing that idea to, to, to fruition. So, um, okay, so I grew up on a farm in the Midwest, in oh. Ohio. Oh, right? nice. So, wow. dairy farm. Yep. So, I'm a farm girl. I, I understand agriculture, you know, and all of those sorts of things. Did they lose their techniques because of all the wars and, the, and corruption, I suppose? Um, and because probably just people came in and grabbed their land and did something else with it? Yeah, I think the techniques, and Ed can add to this, I think the techniques stayed. They were suppressed because of AIDS. Yeah. It was a, was a terrible thing. Right. Uh, and devastated Africa in general. Right. Um, but civil wars were terrible. And you have to remember, too, in the 70s, Idi Amin, who many people know, was right. a very bad guy. Yes, and he was a very bad guy. And imprinted something into that country, into yeah. the psyche of that country that right. was really devastating. People were kidnapped and captured and killed, and they never found people. And you realize you go into the 80s, and there's no infrastructure because the government has fallen apart. Right. The Brits are long gone. And so it's the wild, wild west in Eastern Africa. So they're mm -hmm. looking for some stability and in infrastructure to put something together. Mm -hmm. And BLI is an effort at doing just that for the economy, for the education, for the environment, uh, and to help fight rural poor. Sure, yeah. sure. Because if, they can, if you can feed them, they can grow their own food, right? Even sell some of it at market. Yeah. That helps them get out of poverty. Tremendously, yeah, tremendously. I mean, you have to remember, people live generally in the rural parts of Uganda and many parts of Africa on one dollar a day. That's amazing. Um, so it's hard to put that in perspective. But if you're trying to live on one dollar a day right. and you don't have the tools or the ability to acquire anything—food, land, uh, housing all the things that we sometimes take for granted, mm -hmm. life's, life's pretty challenging. Yeah. And with the war and the AIDS epidemic, they lost a whole generation. So they, 
the youngsters didn't have older folks to teach them how to use the land and how to use the land well. Um, so Bethany Land Institute provides that opportunity where our caretakers, students, come to learn for two years and then after the two-year pr program, mm -hmm. they've completed it, they move on as commissioned caretakers, go back to their home village, begin planting, begin having a farm with cattle or chickens, some animals, goats, goats yes. Goats are big there. Yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah, noisy. <laughs> 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 but um, they go back and then they then create um, a farm there and then begin teaching in the community. I see. All with the ongoing support of BLI. Oh, I see, yeah. I see. So, so wh I'm sure water is also an issue, isn't it? Because it's Africa, right? And they've yeah, been water's... in serious droughts. I don't know in that particular region, but I think other regions have certainly, so I would assume they have been in droughts yeah, as well. Very much so. And there's two things about water. The water that's there, Lake Victoria is the largest lake in Africa. It's a big, beautiful lake, right. but it's very polluted for a number of reasons. Oh. Um, that, that's one factor. The other factor is, in, as Ed talked about, the degradation of the land in mostly in the 80s when the civil wars were going on and then mm -hmm. after, particularly from 2004 to 2014, all the trees were cut down. They needed it for firewood to heat their homes. They oh, needed it for charcoal to cook their food. So they would go into these beautiful old growth forests and just take everything down to survive. And you, you couldn't blame people, but what happens is when you take all the trees down, the water has no cover, the water has no right. kind of uh, sponge, if you will, through the trees and the forest that leads to the rivers, that leads to the lakes and ponds and everything else. So that was gone in the area that we're in. There's only one natural uh, old growth forest in really? within a 180 mile radius. And that's called Lazarus Forest. It's on the property that we manage at BLI. And so that was saved and is saved today. So Are they reforesting? Yes. They're reforesting at a pretty high rate. We have a goal of putting in a million trees by 2050. We've put in 150,000 over the right. last four years. Yeah. Wow. Um, so we're on the way to do that. And what's nice is starting in 2019, after reforestation, the water in the river is running again. And it's not only running clean and running, running pretty strong, it's an aquifer now for the farmers that not only the, where we are, sure. but down the road, sure. down the river, so yeah. to speak. Right. Yeah. Into it, a different country or in the same country? All in the same country. Okay. Yeah. All right. And on the waterfront, <coughs> just um, yeah. the, while I was there, they were constructing um, rain collection systems. Really? So the runoff from the dormitories and the education centers, they're capturing so that there's kind of ongoing use of the rain. So that was under construction, and then just last week I got word that the project was complete and they have this oh, wow. sit water system now running throughout the campus. So Uganda, tell me what's around the country of Uganda. What, what other countries are around it, okay? Because uh, talk to me like I'm a six-year-old, because yeah, I kind of am. Yeah. <laughs> There are six countries surrounding it. The ones that really get the most attention in recent history is South Sudan. Oh yeah, a pretty bad place. It's very bad place. So there's a hard yeah. border there, but there's still leakage, and yeah. th that's dangerous. Frankly. Right, because they come over the border and come over the border, sure. and they, and they, I mean, there's been war and corruption and other things in Uganda, but it pales compared to what South Sudan is going yeah. through. I mean, it was probably the worst spot in the entire world right now, and there's a lot of bad spots in mm -hmm. the world because of what's happening with civil war and people just being killed. Yep. Uh, Rwanda's a small part of oh, it. Sure. Rwanda's had their genocide yep. period, it's, yep. it's over. Um, and that's those are really kind of the two, I wouldn't say flashpoints, but things to watch out for. Around mm -hmm. that, it's relatively stable. Kenya hits a part of it, or else is kind of around to the south. Um, yeah. but, but that's, there's, we, where we are, we're in the central of the country, just north, as Ed said, of Kampala, which is the capital. Mm -hmm. So we're not, we don't feel that effect. I see. In the northwest of the country, there are still raids. There are gangs, if you will, right. or these militant organizations that are still coming into villages and capturing mostly women and taking them away. Right. Which you read about in the neighbor in the in the papers occasionally. Right. Right. Um, but that's that's still a threat. Yeah. So and Uganda is known as the Pearl of Africa. It sits on the equator, so the right. weather is rather temperate. The temperature and. Yeah. 
So, so it doesn't get as hot as so it would in the yeah, other areas. Like well, exactly. Speaking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hot is hot. It's on the equator. Yeah. Yeah. It's on the equator, so the sun is strong. Yeah. But um, they, so their seasons run dry and wet, mm -hmm. and wet is somewhat limited at this stage. Mm. And is that because of climate change? I would say that's a piece of it. And again, one of the objectives of Bethany Land Institute is to use back to nature, back to the ground mm -hmm. type of philosophy and um, how we teach the caretakers um, is about, you know, caring for the earth, right. um, which will then bring change. And one of those changes is in the forest Yes. Uh, where that river is running through now that wasn't running through just a few years ago. Well, would you call it primitive land management? In a sense? I would call well, it primitive. There's already an existing strand of forest that is, that is quite significant. Again, given in uh -huh. the area that there's nothing and all right. of a sudden you come, it's like coming to the Cape and driving down Route 6 and there's trees everywhere. Imagine all but 10% of those trees gone. Yeah. So it's pretty devastating. So the forest is enough of a canopy uh, that we've worked on rebuilding and rebuilding. So there's 160 species of birds. There's lots of animals. There's some pretty big snakes that have come back, um, is which good? is great to have. <laughs> good or bad? The I mean, one of the I was there in March, and one of the one of the gentlemen who was a PhD uh, candidate was out doing soil sampling, sampling, and he came across um, an African cobra and a black mamba in the uh, same little trip. Yikes. So we don't see those around here yeah um, no. but it's it's a good thing they're coming yeah. back they have canopy and they have protection right there are three different types of monkeys there's all kinds of things that mm. are coming back naturally into this forest and as we expand it we expect that to continue to grow and i wouldn't say it's primitive either i, I no. would say uh, mainly because bethany land institute is one of the first institutes that are training people using regenerative um, agriculture okay. methodologies yeah. worldwide. Yeah. So we're kind of we're very early on mm -hmm. um, with uh, not primitive but just natural right. techniques. Sure. Organic. Yeah. Yeah. So okay, you have to explain what natural techniques are. So um, let the soil be, no waste. So if there's um, runoff from the animals. Mm -hmm. um, becomes part of the compost. I got you. So there's okay. no, there's, it's all about using what's on the land, um, as the banana leaves. So as pig urine, yeah. to, I mean, to be blunt about it, no, is no, no, captured yeah. and used into a compost pile to break sure. it down quicker sure, sure, and sure, add sure. the nutrients to it. Yeah. So every little thing is captured. Even there's these amazing things that we've seen. Uh, plastic bottles are very important there. I know they're banned in parts of the Cape and other things, but they're really important to get fresh water to people, and you need water in Africa. Right. But what we've done at BLI is they've built, they've taken the plastic bottles and built greenhouses with them, natural greenhouses. Wow. So they don't have glass, they don't have the ability to do that, but they built these beautiful, sustainable greenhouses to start to grow seeds within these plastic bottles. So That's being wonderful, used. Yeah. 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 Being reused. Being reused, yeah. I know. Being which reused. Is, which that is the problem here is we just throw it out the window of our car. Exactly. And yeah. that's that's the big problem, yeah. right? And, and one of the things that caretakers do when they mo move back to their home mm -hmm. communities, they they begin an effort of collecting. Uh. Mm. So there's this recycling concept that's being brought forth to sure. the communities that they live in, cleaning the communities up, and then, as John described, putting those bottles to use in some way. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. It really yeah. is. And has this affected the population growth? I mean, is the popula was the population stagnant? Was or has it a just the opposite? Or, or yeah, it's just too many people. Too many people. Well, I wouldn't say too many people, but fast growth. So in the last twenty, roughly twenty, twenty-one years, the population has doubled from twenty-three billion oh. to twenty forty-six. Yeah. So That'd growing fast. And probably know too, in, in the Americas, in Europe, and in Asia, population is in decline. Right. Some significantly. You can hear about China and Japan all the time. Right. In Africa, it's going the other way. Yeah. So in Uganda specifically, 50% of the population is under the age of 20. Wow. 17% of the population is under the age of 5. So Thanks. you know, the IMF looks at Africa as a huge opportunity for growth in the future for many things, but they have to harness the educational piece, which they right. haven't. Right. The, the people are just 
Little kids don't go to day school. One in 10 goes to preschool. Um, only 30% of students go from primary school, elementary school, into junior high and high school. And the rest of them just go, they give up and they go to work. 70% wow. of the people don't go into high school. Right, so they so can't the, read, some can't even can't read and it's, write. It's about a fourth grade education on average yeah. um, in Uganda. So that has to be picked up and that's a difficult thing because that's really the auspices of the government and the government isn't on top of those kind of things generally. So private enterprise like this really can help augment that. Yeah. With the growth of the young population, they're migrating to big city centers like Kampala. Uh, so then they become overcrowded and then right. during all that you end up with a number of right. social problems. Mm -hmm. So at Bethany right. Land Institute, again, we are educating, as John's pointed out, right. not only to do the farming, but to understand the marketplace. Sure. So there's an economic piece where at, at BLI it's really training that says, here's how to use the land and here's how to be an entrepreneur using the land. I see. And then put the land to use and understand how you can make a living. Sure. So, so how, do, how do the young Ugandans get to BLI? I mean, how, how are they chosen? You go into villages and you were gonna go, we're gonna, you really seem like you're with it, we'll mm -hmm. take you. Or do they want to come? Do they, I wouldn't, I don't know, do they apply? I don't even know they would have it. There is, there is an application type process oh, um, to oh, okay. um, mm -hmm. coming on board. Mm -hmm. And we, um, the, the founders, and the uh, staff mm -hmm. have a great network of people throughout the country. So the word has spread about BLI. Some of our commission caretakers have said, oh, I have a family member that would ah. like to come in, in, to the institute. I have a friend in the community. So it's, it's, it's a word of mouth um, opportunity, but through an application process that says, yes, this, this young person is ready, um, they're of age, and they're, they're, they're committed to understanding the process. And what does of age mean in Uganda? So um, in, at, at BLI, um, the ideal age is uh, late teens to early 20s. I see. Yeah. Okay. Kind of in a college age, they yeah. really are. And they're coming from all rural parts, and the hope is to educate them after, it's a two-year program, and then send them back to their villages right. to continue to do that. And we continue to support them when they go back. They just don't go back and they're gone. I see. We help with microloans, we help with consulting. If there's something wrong with the pigs or the bees or the, or the flowers, right. uh, we can help consult and do that. So and it started very slow with eight kids, 10 ki kids, now we're up to 39 in two cohorts. So it's gone from 18 in the first two wow. to 39 in the second two. COVID interrupted things. Yeah, we started sure. in 2019, 2020, shut down. Right. Uh, but we've graduated 18 and we're about to graduate next year, uh, 39 more. That's great. Now, is it mostly men? Uh, no, no, it's actually a pretty good mix. I mean, it started, yeah. I think it's been about 50-50 well, all the way Well, you know, through. other countries, their it's view different. of whim, women is so different. And that's true in Uganda, too. So the fact <coughs> that it's, it's pretty well divided, I think it's about a 50-50 split. Um, it's, it's both. There isn't that... Um, you know that that the discrimination, whether it's subtle or otherwise. Right. Um, no, they're they're both. In fact, the employees are there are quite a few female employees who are acting as instructors or That's caretakers great. themselves. Yeah. yeah. One of our uh, mo more successful uh, caretakers that completed the program is um, has a farm that is just thriving. Oh, is that so right? Alice, yes, Alice, yeah. yeah, Alice. So we Beautiful. both have had the opportunity to meet Alice and. Get to, get to know her, understand what she's doing. She has animals, she's got produce, she's got a market, she's teaching folks in the community. And she's one of the caretakers that said, I'd love my sister to, to, to come this. to the BLI. Yeah. Sure, because it ups them. Right. It brings them up, it lifts them up, right? Exactly. Um, so BLI was started by three priests. Mm -hmm. And, and it was started in the early 2000s, right? They started to get together in 2012 to talk okay. about doing something to give back. I see, mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, and they all had a, a, an interest. So one was, let's, let's work with the forest. Right. Someone else said, let's work with the land. And then another one of the um, 
co-founder said, let's, let's make sure that if we're getting them to understand that, that they understand the economics in the marketplace. Sure, sure. So, so, so what is the, I mean, how does it, how do you get money for it? Do you ask for donations? I mean, I, I'm going to be honest with you, mm -hmm. I never heard of it. I didn't know this uh, was going on. And that's a wonderful thing that it is going on, but I've never heard of it. You know, you hear about the heifer group mm -hmm. that, you know, you buy animals, you know, you yep. give money towards yes. animals and all yeah. that, right? right? All the right. time, buy a goat for somebody. And, yep. um, I'm into goats. Can you tell? <laughs> 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 it's all about you'd, goats. You'd love Africa, a lot of goats. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Well, I love pygmy goats because they're fun. Oh, yeah. Uh, fun. yeah. I grew fun. up with, I, we had goats on our farm. farm in Ohio. Yeah. 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 So, that said, how, do you, how, do, how does it get funded? I mean, it's not getting money from the Uganda government, is it, or is it? No, there's no, no. government funding, at least not yet. And I don't think there will be. That's not the way they really Work. operate. Yeah. Um, but a lot of the funding comes from private donations, either mm -hmm. organizations uh, in the United States, which give pretty significantly. So there are mm -hmm. about 130 organizations or, or individuals in the United States mm -hmm. that are donors. And there are donors in Uganda, but you can imagine Uganda doesn't have the wealth that the United States has. So we have two separate entities. We have one set up in Uganda and a board and an entity to run what's happening mm -hmm. in Uganda. And then Ed and I are on the U.S. board. And the U.S. board, the primary objective is, is really development, fundraising. Sure. To make it well, well known, to partnership with places like Notre Dame and other organizations, just to build a profile in order to receive funds. And we've been very fortunate to have generous entities give us the money to be able to build the buildings and be able to fund things so that's your, just really for capital needs. We're able to build buildings and really move things along. And then individual donors can do anything from give $50 or they can give $5,000, which covers a two-year education for one wow. student wow. for two years, sure. uh, which is quite remarkable. Um, uh, yeah, so fundraising is, is a big part of what we do. The other thing we do, and Ed was talking about Alice going off and, and building a farm, when they graduate and become full-time caretakers, we have something called a SACO. It's essentially a credit union where any of us can give $50, $100, $1,000, and it allows us to then give micro loans to these people when I they go see. out. I so see. that's the major force of, of funding I for see. the students to go out and, and start their business. Sure, um, sure. And it's, it's like the SBA in the United States. Right, sure. Yeah. Yeah. sure. And even the, even the caretakers, while they're on campus for the two years, they each have their own savings account Sure. Where whatever money they're earning, because Goes we do sell that. the we do sell the produce and the goods from yeah. from the you know from BLI campus, right. they then earn that and that money is put into their account at the SACO, right. and um, they have that as well as both spending money while they're there for two years, but also uh, you know savings to accumulate over sure. time to take back to their village. I would think the Gates Foundation would want to be involved. In they're more, like they're very specific on, I've worked with them in the past on something else on health care. Oh, that's right, like for immunization. Eradicating disease and right, all of that. Right, right. Um, but that's the type of organization, and we don't have somebody like that, but we have some pretty well known within that space helping to support us. Oh, that's uh, great. Which is tremendously helpful, so, yeah. Um, how in the world, Falmouth Sandwich, <laughs> <laughs> Did you get involved? <laughs> ah, so I'm gonna um, grab some water. Sure yeah. thing. So 20 years ago, I met uh, one of the co-founders, <coughs> uh, Emmanuel Katongale. Uh, he was coming to. I was living in North Carolina at the time, oh my and God. he was coming to teach at uh, <laughs> Duke <laughs> University, and um, he. I got to know him. Um, oh my gosh. And at one point, he was going back home. Um, for six months and asked a group of us, hey, could you put together some um, boxes of coloring books and crayons and toothpaste and toothbrushes that I can take back? And we said, absolutely. But one of my friends said, but next year, you have to take some of us back with you. Uh -huh. So that began this um, idea that Emmanuel had in his head of um, creating these pilgrimages bringing folks from the States back home with them during some of the summer month. Um, so during that time, I really got... You fell in love. I fell in love with the Pearl of Africa. Yeah. I fell in love with the people because it was really a, a pilgrimage of let's just sit around and talk. We weren't there to build something. We weren't there to Or admonish them for not doing something. Yeah, it or wasn't like, it was we're just coming in and telling you how to do it. Never. Yeah, yeah, never, do, never that. Killer. Just this 
conversation. It was all about conversation, much like we're having today. Mm. Um, and so that began my journey. Um, and I stayed involved. Um, I helped form a nonprofit back in those days, 20 years ago, that focused in on water and children's education. Um, we did a lot of great work. That organization continues. Um, and then when Emmanuel started um, this vision of Bethany Land Institute with his two childhood friends, he, j he, he just has an enthusiasm that just contagious. Um, is contagious. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And how did you get involved? Because you just recently got involved. I did, yeah. Well, I got you know a lot, though, for somebody <laughs> who just recently got involved. No, well, I, it's kind of a yeah, crash, <laughs> crash course in all of this. Um, I, I guess philanthropically, I'm interested in uh, locally in children and education and the environment. So that was already kind of in my toolbox, if you will. Sure. And I went out to Notre Dame last year for a year and did a fellowship program on campus. And one of the speakers in a class was Emmanuel, and he talked about not only what he does in the, in the Keogh School, yeah. which is the global, global study school, but what he was doing with BLI. Wow. And we hit it off. We just it instantly, yeah. what he was doing really resonated with me and doing it in a, in a different place so you can really help somebody as much as you can in your own backyard right. resonated also. And we met off and on and started to have lunch together pretty regularly. And nice. he finally invited me to come in March. He said, you have to see it before we do anything, but you've got to see it. You've got to come here. And you were totally impressed. And I was blown away by <laughs> knowing what the problems were right. and hearing and reading about it. But going there, you go from Kampala, which is just absolute chaos right. and around the country. And then you go to this BLI and Nandere and the hills and the, the beauty and the success that it's having. And, you and think the calming effect of it all. Very much so. It's, tra yeah, I mean, it's that's, tranquil. That's part of it. Very much it? so. It's yeah. just at a very different level. It's organic. They're educating people. The environment's being taken care of. Um, it's, it's just remarkable. So I was Im very impressed um, at how organized it was and how passionate people were, everybody that touched it. And so I came back and I said, I'm in. And oh, I that's started, great. started on the board in, in that's May. That's great. Yeah, it's been great. Well, so if somebody from Sandwich, Massachusetts, or Falmouth... <laughs> <laughs> we'll compete. <laughs> we'll, <laughs> we'll have a runoff. Who can do more? Yeah. Um, wants to give to something like that. How would they do that? Certainly one of the best ways is our, our website, the BethanyLandInstitute.com. Mm -hmm. um, there's, people can learn more about um, BLI there, and there's a link there to um, donate um, and, and help us that way. And I'm going to ask you about the pillars. Just if do you know the the pill, they talk about the pillars, the foundation of what they do. Is there a is there a, um, I was thinking there was a mantra almost for each one of the pillars for the building as I looked at the website. Mary, uh, Martha's and Lazarus. Yeah. 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 So um, um, Lazarus is about the the forest. I go. Um, which is one of the, the pillars mm -hmm. of um, dealing with the um, degradation of forest land and re revitalizing it. Um, the um, education piece is uh, with Mary's school. I see. Um, Mary being an educator and mm -hmm. that, um, and back to the earth. Right. Um, so, um, and then uh, Martha is about Martha's Market, mm -hmm. um, and That's great. quite honestly, when I first heard Martha's Market, <coughs> I really went there thinking, "Oh, because they said they had a roadside get, stand, which they snack. do." <laughs> so I thought, so I really thought it was going You're to be something like <laughs> like what we used to have here in Sandwich with Crow's right, Farm. Right. No, <laughs> I thought it was going to be Crow's Farm, and but no, it it's a market that is much a larger concept. It's not just the roadside stand; it's about entrepreneurship. It's about being economically successful. Um, it's about leadership it. um, and, and then Wonderful. how to bring that market, scale it Great. out to other communities. Yeah, the economics of it are very important because if you're dealing, I'm selling you zucchini, that's right. one thing, but if somebody comes down to buy it for the school, how do I price that at yeah. a different level? And right. how do I market my services? Right, how do you, how do you get, yeah. yeah, big part of it. Do yeah. a wholesale yes. for it. Yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah, wholesale basically. retail. Yeah. 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 So I want to thank you. So interesting. And it's Ed and John. Yep. Yes. <laughs> and it's the Bethany Land Institute. And you are doing wonderful works well, from the United States to there. How wonderful is that? It must make you sleep better at night. It feels good. 
It's it's wonderful. And it's all about giving, isn't it? It is. Giving it back. Is. It is. Giving yeah. back. Yeah. Sure is. Yeah. Anywhere thank, in the world. Yeah. Thank you, Melinda, for oh, yeah, inviting us okay. in. Well, Sam considering Community, I got television. you both confused I wanted, before we even started. <laughs> no worries. But here's the good news. Everybody who watches this program knows me, and they know I will be confused. So I guess that's my charm. That's I don't know. Yeah, anyway, thank you is. so much. So wonderful to hear about this. And I hope you get a few bucks from Sandwich and from Great. Thalma. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Thank right. you Appreciate so much. It. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. I want to thank Ed and John for the great work they do. Oh, my goodness. The Bethany Land Institute, teaching Ugandans how to farm, reteaching them how to farm, really, and doing all these wonderful things so they can learn how to produce their own food, sell their own food, make a profit and live. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. So thank you for joining me. And you know what? I'll see you next time on another Cape Conversations. Mm -hmm.